Welcome to this event. It is incredible to see this many participants in the room and we're simultaneously web streaming as well. So welcome to our online audience uh, too. We are gathered here to talk about managing for development results. I'm joined by a distinguished panel from the World Bank Group, Inter-American Development Bank, within the World Bank Group, also the board, um, Karen Mathias, is, is going to join us shortly. Um, and, uh, and Auguste Kwame from IEG will be facilitating the discussion of the panel and introduce all of the panelists. I want to give some introduction remarks to set the stage. And then uh, Raghavan Narayan uh, is going to give a presentation on the report that is really the foundation for having this conversation. Our results and performance report that focused on managing for development results. So why is managing for development results important? Um, I would like to pose the question, do you believe that results come about by accident, by coincidence, or do you believe that we can actually do something about achieving results? If you do be believe the latter, then you need to think about how do we manage for development results? How do we work towards them and deliver them as efficiently and effectively as we uh, possibly can? Um, why do we think it matters right now? Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it has always mattered but it matters now more than ever because we are operating in a world of complexity. And many of you have probably heard this word before, and some of you might have rolled your eyes and said like, oh, there's a lot of fluffy stuff that's being talked about. But complexity has to do with that we don't have this very neat linear results chains where you can say like, I have this input, I have this action, this output, this outcome, and this impact, but there are many more interconnectedness. And so therefore we have to make an even greater effort to manage that our actions drive towards the results we would like to achieve. Um, and this conscious effort to work towards uh, outcomes, to work towards development results is even more necessary in this day and age where we see many countries uh, closing in on themselves, where uh, people are thinking like, oh, why are we working with all of these countries around the world and, and they're just creating problems and whatever. So we have to demonstrate, we have to manage for, and we have to demonstrate the development results that we achieve. And that is even more important in an age of the sustainable development goals. We have uh, so many, 17 goals, we have many, many more targets and lots of indicators. So these goals are interconnected. They are a manifestation of the complexity of what we're dealing with. If the development community would uh, pursue each one goal in isolation of the other one, we might not produce better results. We would actually, in some cases, have very tense relationships because they co uh, have conflicts or, or um, conflicting ambitions over the results and over the resources that need to be put to, to the fore in order to develop those uh, effects. And at the same time, there are opportunities for synergies between these development goals. And again, if we don't manage for the results, then we might not realize the synergies effectively. So now the third question is why IEG? Why are we here? Uh, don't we come always at the tail end and evaluate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in many of our evaluations, we have covered this aspect because the uh, managing for development results has to do with quality at entry, how well is a project designed, how well are the indicators established. It has to do with the monitoring throughout the project implementation and taking course corrections. And so we have observed this many a time. We have done evaluations that focused on 
the self-evaluation system that focused on learning and lending, um, that looked at um, how well impact evaluations are done and what they mean in the cycle of the project. And so in this particular results and uh, performance report, we did a synthesis of how well is the bank group doing. Um, not to sort of give a scorecard and say like congratulations or you're not good enough, but really to stimulate the discussion because we sincerely believe that if the World Bank Group would up its game in this domain, its overall outcomes, the services and results it delivers to the client countries will be enhanced significantly. And so that is what we're hoping to achieve with this panel discussion, yet another conversation to stimulate the ideas for what needs uh, to be done in order to achieve some changes in this domain. And with that, let me hand over to Raghavan who will talk, uh, walk us through the more detailed uh, findings of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, distinguished panelists, colleagues, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Raghavan Narayanan. I work in IAG's uh, Finance and Private Sector Development Unit. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, uh, all the other colleagues at IAG who contributed to this report. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, this is a synthesis report. It builds on several other evaluations uh, run by several other teams, uh, and uh, I'm literally standing on the shoulders of these giants back in the office, so thank you. Um, I have uh, about 10 minutes, a uh, couple of slides to synthesize uh, what we found. And I have basically three uh, bullet points to try and uh, capture the essence of the report. So we want to start with what is managing for results? Uh, how did IEG define it? What is the framework based on? And we'll go through a little bit of why uh, does it matter in the institutional context and the client context. And then I'll close it with a couple of uh, bullet points on uh, our key findings. So what is managing for results? Uh, in short, M4R. Um, IEG defined it as a two-pronged approach that helps to improve organizational results. This is based on economic and business literature. It defines M4R as a strategy, as an approach uh, that uh, connects two distinct uh, components. One is, as you see on the left side of the screen, systems that are in place for measuring and monitoring results. And then on the right side of the, of the picture, you see uh, this little bobhead that's uh, related to adaptive management and learning. Now, it's a the, uh, the adaptive management learning is, uh, is also refers to an approach where we use data, we use systems, uh, and the evidence available to understand what worked, what didn't work, what are the drivers of results, and how can we enable uh, course corrections uh, in our projects or programs based on this learning. So these two components essentially uh, form the core M4R platform. Now for those of you who may not be dealing with results on a development results on a database, I want to you know, give you a little uh, a metaphor here. So it's a very interesting social experiment uh, conducted by Tom Wujek and Peter Skillman from IDEO. It's a, premier design consultancy firm in Palo Alto, California. And uh, the experiment was to bring a group of 20 people, five different teams. They were each given uh, 20 uh, sticks of spaghetti, uh, um, a tape, uh, a yard of string, and one marshmallow. And they were asked to construct the, uh, the tallest structure that they could possibly can with these objects. So it's called the marshmallow challenge. And uh, the five teams were basically split as a group of business school uh, graduates, a uh, team of lawyers, a team of CEOs, senior management people, uh, architects was the fourth, and finally a group of kindergarten kids. And uh, so they were given 15 minutes basically to come up with the tallest structure possible. Uh, and to draw an analogy, it's really the 2030 goals as, that we see as the 15 minutes. And uh, uh, at the end of 15 minutes, uh, lo and behold, uh, the, uh, they all had some answer, some solution to the problem. Uh, the, uh, the best performer was obviously the architect. Thank God for that. Uh, they used, uh, you know, concepts of mathematics, science, physics, uh, triangle, self-reinforcing structures. Um, and the worst performer was the, uh, the team of business school graduates because they spent most of their time 
trying to find that one solution that answers everything. The lawyers came next. Uh, they were still figuring out who's the alpha dog in the room, and uh, all due respects to lawyers in the room. Uh, then the, uh, the next were the CEOs. They were still waiting for their morning coffee to be delivered by their assistants. Uh, but surprisingly, the, the group that performed the second best were the team of kindergarten kids. Uh, and why is that? Because uh, they spoke to each other. They collaborated. They uh, made many mistakes. The spaghetti sticks broke. They learned from their mistakes. They course corrected. And uh, they believed in each other, and they learned from each other. So they exhibited the key principles of collaborating, course correcting, evaluating each other's work, validating, and so on. So that's uh, an interesting experiment. Now, as an evaluator, I validated this at home. I have uh, two uh, boys at home, and uh, the results were accurate. They obviously made a structure better than mine. And for the record, I was a business school graduate myself. So... <laughs> uh, so. Uh, this is to explain the, the metaphor again. The systems here are the spaghetti sticks, the marshmallow, the yard, uh, the, the tape, and the string. And how we deal with these systems, that's the adaptive management and learning, just to give you an idea of how the two uh, connect with each other. Uh, why does it matter in the World Bank Group's context? Uh, the two dimensions, uh, again, to this uh, principle, both for systems and for management learning, so institutional dimension, uh, this deals with uh, the efforts and initiatives within the organization and how we deal and uh, interact with each other on corporate management. And on the client dimension, how much or how to what extent we support uh, client capacity for to help them report on the progress made towards uh, sustainable goals. And uh, what is our institutional ability to assess this progress? So there are these two dimensions that play along with these two components. So uh, in IAG's assessment, uh, this is how we frame the, the, the problem, and uh, we try to understand what are the results from that. So again, this is a synthesis report, so this builds on five or six other evaluations over a period of three, three years. So the first finding related to systems. So the good news is there's been a lot of progress. Uh, it's a little non-linear, as you can see from the, the little chart. Uh, it's just our own construction of how we, we found uh, the progress. Uh, as you can see, the, the spaghetti sticks, uh, which are placed on the right side, self-evaluations, global delivery, statistical capacity, uh, ESG standards in terms of private sector, results-based country strategies, and the marshmallow here is the corporate scorecard. So that basically sits at the, at the top of the, the chain. Uh, so uh, our uh, finding was that there's been good progress. Uh, a little bit of uh, urgency is required. We have the 15-minute game in mind. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, what, what are the opportunities and challenges here, uh, uh, we found that uh, good analytics, uh, availability of data, and most importantly, what are the results at the beneficiary end? Uh, we still uh, do not have enough evidence on that, and that presents uh, both the challenge and opportunity in terms of our systems being geared to be able to capture that. So that was a key finding. Uh, the second component deals with uh, adaptive management and learning. Uh, this relates to our strategies, our own behaviors, uh, how we deal with uh, failures, and uh, you know, do we really have uh, the ability to learn uh, from our own uh, experiences. So our findings uh, on this component was that adaptive management and learning receives very little attention. Uh, there are several initiatives going on. Uh, some are positive, uh, but for those uh, who are interested in data here in this room, we have a couple of data points on the slide. So about 28% of the projects, only about 28% of the projects discuss the real uh, drivers of, of results and outcomes. So uh, that was relatively low. Uh, and uh, at the country level, 40% of the partnership frameworks, the country partnership frameworks had some objectives related to this M4R systems. Uh, but less than half of them were actually achieved. So, and there's a lot of weakness on the client dimensions. So although it might be strong on the institutional part, uh, some work needs to be done on the, on the client dimension. Uh, internally, the approval culture uh, still uh, rules. As you know, managing for development results, uh, we are looking at the outcomes. Uh, we're not really interested in how we manage for commitments and approvals. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, aspect. Uh, and as you know, the, the marshmallow, the, the scorecard, deals a lot with commitments. Uh, we need to move a little bit beyond that. Uh, everybody talks about learning. Uh, we uh, need to be willing to uh, you know, 
make it a higher priority. We all know it's a priority. Uh, and we have to, uh, our finding was that uh, the bank has the opportunity to go beyond uh, the internal data sources available. We'll have to triangulate from uh, external sources uh, to be more effective. Um, and uh, how do we deal with the failures? That's another interesting question. We dealt with it in our ROSES evaluation. What do we uh, think about uh, self-evaluations? Uh, and uh, does the system um, and the institution allow us to learn from our failures? So to summarize, two key takeaways. Uh, good progress on, on the first component, uh, measurements and systems, less on adaptive management and learning. And uh, IAG supports uh, a strategic coherent uh, M4R action plan. So these are two key takeaways uh, from the study. Thank you. And I would like to uh, hand over to August uh, for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Raghavan, um, for this very, uh, very brief um, presentation of the report. Um, so now let's move to the panel. Uh, we have, as Caroline said, a very distinguished uh, panel, which probably shows the importance of this topic. Um, and also your presence here is really a, uh, an indication of how important the, the topic of result and managing for result is. Um, there are a few chairs that are still available here, so if you get tired standing there at the back, there are at least two here, two there. Uh, feel free to uh, come and use them. Yeah. Um, so let me first introduce the panel, and then um, then we'll go through the Q&A. Uh, to my immediate right, we have uh, Karen Mathiason, who is uh, the U.S. Executive Director at our board, um, and she's also a member of the uh, CODI, which is uh, the Oversight Committee for IEG. Um, Karen joined the board in 2015, and before that she had a very distinguished uh, career at the U.S. Uh, Treasury, um, where she um, uh, was Director and um, Assistant, uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, covering various uh, regions uh, from the Middle East to East Asia and South Asia. So welcome to the panel, Karen. Um, to the right of Karen, we have uh, Hans Peter uh, Lanke. Uh, Hans Peter Lanke is uh, the Vice President um, for Economics and Private Sector Development at uh, the IFC. Um, Hans Peter joined the, the, the bank group uh, recently um, from the EBRD, where he was the Managing Director for Corporate Strategy. Uh, and prior to the EBRD, um, I learned you know, through this uh, bio that Hans Peter worked at the IMF but we'll not hold that against you. <laughs> um, he worked at the IMF uh, and worked in the PGR uh, department at the IMF, which is the equivalent of OPCS. So he's been in this business of results for many, many years. And uh, he will tell us uh, about some of the innovation he's bringing to, to IFC. To uh, Hans Peter's right, uh, we have um, Farid uh, Belhaj. Um, Farid is currently the Chief of Staff of the World Bank Group uh, and Director of the Office of the President, where among many, many other responsibilities, he uh, ensures appropriate follow-up, uh, follow-through on actions and decisions and commitment by the President, working very closely with the CEOs and the Managing Directors. Uh, Farid, uh, before joining the uh, Office of the President, was the World Bank uh, Group Country Director for the Middle East, covering very interesting countries uh, such as Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Iran, um, and have personally experienced working with Ferret. He's uh, a dynamo, I can tell you. And before that uh, role, he was also country director in the Pacific. Uh, welcome to the panel, Ferret, and thanks for joining us. Uh, to my left, we have uh, a, a guest, a real guest in the proper sense of the word, uh, coming uh, from outside the bank, Miguel, um, uh, Sorry, uh, Luis Miguel Castilla Rubio uh, is manager for the Office of Strategy and Planning at the Inter American Development Bank. Miguel joined this um, institution in January, and before then, um, Miguel was a visiting scholar at MIT's Center of International Studies. Um, he also served in government um, as ambassador to the U.S. and as Minister of Finance for Peru between 2011 and 2014. And he just told me uh, uh, earlier today that you also work at the World Bank. Um, so, uh, you know, welcome back to the building, Miguel. Um, 
Then to uh, Miguel's left, we have uh, uh, Shio. Shio Kanda um, is acting director uh, at the OPCS, and uh, she's director for uh, risks and results. Um, she joined the bank uh, through the YP in 1994, and she has worked in uh, various uh, departments. Uh, Shio is now responsible for coordinating uh, banks' group uh, response to um, uh, IEG's work, um, and uh, she, she works very closely with us on all our evaluations. Uh, Shio, thanks, and thanks for joining the panel. So with this brief introduction, uh, what we have suggested is that each panel member be given three minutes for an opening statement, um, um, and they will talk about what they have on their mind, um, obviously related to the topic, and then we will have a first round of questions uh, uh, from me, um, and they will also have three minutes to answer the first uh, questions that they will receive, and then we'll open it to you, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the audience. Um, I, I understand you have access to poll everywhere, so you can send questions through your phone, um, either from the room. You can also send uh, questions online if you're connected um, online. Then uh, we will uh, see which questions we, 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 we select for answering. And, and if we don't answer your question uh, because of lack of time, uh, and if you're really interested in hearing from us, you can send us a reminder and we will send you the answers after the event. Uh, with this uh, brief introduction, let's uh, me uh, hand over to uh, Karen for the first opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, so as a board representative, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the perspective of CODI members, um, and that is that we are strongly supportive of the work that the IEG does here. It's really essential that we have this annual reminder of what really matters at this institution, which is, of course, results. Um, and that, that's the good news. I think the, you know, the, the troubling piece is that we need that annual reminder. And, um, and Caroline knew a couple of, I think last year I said, I know what this is going to say, right? It's going to say, the, the challenges are quality of entry, adaptive learning, strong TTLs, people on the ground, FaceTime. I mean, their, their findings aren't that surprising. They're not, they don't move and change from year to year. Um, we have a pretty good sense of what we need to do to manage for results. Um, it's, it's that it's really, really hard to do. Um, the incentives are often not aligned with results because you have at the outset the focus on, um, by, by frankly, both the client and, um, and sometimes the, the task team is on moving and getting the project out the door. It's on volumes. That's often what's been rewarded. Um, and often by the time the results have been realized, you know, the task team leader has long since moved on. So, you know, it, it is definitely a, a cultural challenge for any institution to really effectively manage for results, and the World Bank is no exception in that regard. So what we at Cody have tried to do is to encourage management to think about ways to shift uh, incentives so they can indeed do better um, managing for results. And I, I think we've seen some really good signs in that direction. Um, we're seeing that the corporate scorecard, for example, now has a beneficiary feedback as an indicator. Um, there will be a, a score on M&E, um, and of course, uh, and quality of entry is, is, is already there, and we can talk about this more later, but I think that the challenge there is that the quality of entry is reviewed at the end, not at the beginning, which when you think about it, doesn't, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, knowledge, I'm seeing a real uh, strengthening on the knowledge side at the bank. Um, there's always this tension between the, the learning and accountability. And, um, you know, we now have a new uh, head of knowledge. And we've been really, we just got, board just got briefed on the knowledge strategy and it, it looks like it has a lot of, it has some real teeth. So um, my, my overall sense is that while there's, um, there's room for more, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for, uh, for this brief remark and staying within the time. Uh, let's move <laughs> to Hans-Peter. 
Thank you, August, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for not holding my past against me. <laughs> um, just a couple of remarks. One is uh, on the RAP, uh, the Results and Performance Report uh, itself, which uh, is a very important part, as Karen has stressed, of the overall m and &E framework and, uh, and has been key for monitoring trends and operations, and the messages are not always comfortable. I have to say. So the last one uh, we had showed that uh, there had been a fairly persistent decline in the quality and the development impact quality of, um, of uh, IFC operations. Uh, we formed a, uh, a group uh, to work on this together with IEG. I think it was, uh, it was one of these really successful uh, cases of collaboration where we were drawing on the knowledge that IEG had uh, and, uh, and the, the access that, uh, that our colleagues had and uh, designed um, uh, some corrective measures uh, around work quality, and uh, with, uh, including uh, a new accountability framework, which is now in place. And we hope that this will address some of the root causes of this declining performance. So it's, uh, this report uh, has impact. Second, um, the choice of topic for, uh, focus on managing for results in 2016 uh, is also very welcome, is very timely in our case. Uh, this question of how we actually use results to feed back uh, on the go in real time, but also into new operations is central to uh, some initiatives that we have been uh, taking. Uh, and key among those is the development of a new framework for uh, ex ante and ex post uh, project development impact assessment. We call it AIM the anticipated impact measurement and monitoring. Uh, so far, I've seen systems have focused on the ex post, uh, the so-called DOTS, the Development Outcome Tracking System, which kicked in three years after uh, a project uh, is initiated, uh, and, uh, and where uh, yeah, sometimes it may have been difficult to, to, to see how, that, how the lessons from that, those kinds of uh, monitoring would feed into project decisions. Um, AIM is going to um, fill a gap here by uh, providing a, uh, an upstream <coughs> assessment uh, prior to decision making on projects as, as far upstream as, as possible. Um, we're going to use uh, quantitative scoring methods for the development impact uh, that we expect uh, projects to have. And that has uh, several benefits. One is that it helps with the tracking and the, and the analysis over time of development impact of individual projects and of the portfolio. Uh, second, it's, uh, it helps with project uh, uh, decision making. Uh, if projects don't score well enough, they should not go ahead. And third, uh, it helps uh, with the incentive systems that we're trying to create, the scorecard. We will incorporate uh, development uh, impact targets in the IFC scorecard uh, with uh, equal weight uh, with uh, uh, general uh, delivery and financial performance. Um, the second M in AIM uh, refers to monitoring, and that is uh, uh, where we will track the actual performance of projects against their expected impact, and we'll do so throughout the life of the project uh, immediately when it gets uh, initiated. Um, so AIM is going to subsume the current DOTS system, is going to build on it, it's going to expand on it by adding a market impact lens to the project impact lens that we have today, um, and is going to allow on a, on a real-time basis to feed back into the project. So if we see a project going the wrong way, uh, this offers us an opportunity to, uh, to intervene and with operations try to do something about it. It also uh, offers us uh, the opportunity to learn and feed into new projects. Uh, it's going to be the same teams. We are, we're going to have an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, service on projects from the upstream uh, to the downstream uh, in the same uh, units. So we hope we have learned. Um, uh, Caroline, thanks for your messages. And I'll pass it over. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Hans Peter. Uh, let's move to uh, Farid. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, August, and thank you very much, everybody, for being here and, as Carol mentioned, sharing your your lunchtime with us. Uh, let me say a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to really uh, 
talk from the standpoint of somebody who spent the last 15 years in the field. And uh, something that I'm you know, bothering everybody around me over the last seven months with is really to stress this issue. We have here in this bank, frankly, two realities. The realities of here and the reality of the field. And those two realities need to be bridged one way or the other. And by the way, this is one of the challenges of IEG, actually, to really take very much into consideration the fact that you have people out there being faced with, you know, how difficult the situation is, how fluid, how, how, how far we can go in terms of being uh, adaptable, how we, we, we can actually manage our engagement with our clients, in particular when we work in, you know, you mentioned that I was in the Pacific, very, very low capacity, very small countries, having tremendous challenges that have nothing to do with, you know, whether they are adopting or not the right policy uh, recommendations, because they have you know, the challenges of, 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 the, of all the tsunamis of this world that are, you know, uh, coming to them. Or in uh, countries that are, you know, going through man-made disasters, you know, uh, the Iraq of, the, of this world, the Iran, uh, the, the, no, not, not Iran, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Syrians of this world, etc. And, and in those countries, we also need to be extremely aware of the reality that we are, we are, we are facing. Another reality that we are facing, and this is, you know, for you, Karen. When we go to the board with a project or with a country partnership framework, frankly, there is something called the day after, and that day after means that we need to start reviewing, reconsidering, reshaping what we have gone to the board with, and you know, what we got the authorization to move ahead with the, with, with the board with. And that's also a, re a reality. So when we go through all of our uh, preparation and appraisal and pre-appraisal, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that takes us a few months. Well, sometimes it takes a very short time, sometimes it takes forever. But then we go to the board and we have a good discussion. And, uh, and immediately after that, in particular, again, in those countries where the situation is very, very fluid, we need to start readjusting and re, you know, re you know, looking at other parameters. And that's, a, that's also very important for us to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, another issue that we need to keep in mind is the issue of risk taking. We are, you know, when we go to the board, when we talk to, to our top management, yes, everybody is telling us, tells us we, need, we need to take risk. We need to take risks frankly because in the majority of the countries we are working with, or we, we are working in, you know, the risk of bank engagement is you know, somewhat high or very high. We take risks, but then the risks have this very odd tendency from time <coughs> to time to materialize. And when they materialize, what do we do? Well, do we have people behind us to back us up? We hope so, well, I don't know. Uh, and how can we adapt fast so that we can bring those risks to a place where they become manageable? That also is, a, is an issue that you need to put on the table and that cannot be uh, assessed sitting in Washington. We really need to have that kind of direct impact uh, assessment from, from, from the field. Third point is the client capacity. Uh, m and &E is absolutely important and managing for results. Obviously, the clients want results. Why would they, go, would they come to the bank if they didn't want results and outcome? Uh, how to measure results, how to build their capacity to manage those results and to understand how things move is generally a, a tall order, particularly in, in countries, in very, very small countries or countries that are coming out of you know, a, a difficult situation. So we have this tendency of uh, getting into a capacity substitution uh, discussion, which is not good. Actually, it is you know, giving them a very, very bad advice when we come and sit there, tell them, uh, or not, not just tell them what to do, tell them what to do, and then if they cannot do it immediately, we do it in their stead. Not good. Not a good idea. And that brings me to the one of uh, well, my last point, and that is that development is not static, and development is not instant coffee. It takes time. I would call it Turkish coffee. You, know? <laughs> it, you need you need to take it to, to, to the fire, up and down, etc., so that it takes uh, good and right. And we need really to have that you know, time dimension very much in mind so that we, when, when, when we promise, we keep our promises, we don't overpromise, and we make sure that, you know, managing for results is, 
in reality managing the reality so that those results correspond to the reality that we are faced with. And I'm happy to engage with you guys you know, in, in the Q&A afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fred. This is interesting. I like the Turkish coffee analogy. Uh, let's move to Miguel. Thank you, Augusta. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the independent uh, evaluation group for inviting me. Um, I think this discussion is very timely because uh, a lot of our shareholders are actually discussing this. Um, G7, G20 countries are, are putting managing, managing for development results, uh, value for money overall, as, as one of the top uh, agenda items in their discussions. So I think, uh, uh, you know, trying to share lessons, what we're doing, uh, learning from uh, successes and specifically from failures and challenges, I think it's very, very positive for our institution. So uh, just to give you three opening um, uh, remarks, and then we, we can, uh, I can extend it uh, as I tell you a little bit about the IDB, uh, um, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, Group experience. I would say all of this took a cultural, there was a, there was a need, there was a trigger, which was um, you know, uh, about more than a decade ago, uh, which was tied to a capital replenishment process which actually was a trigger that enabled our institution to really evolve and to start taking seriously, uh, you know, re measuring results, uh, basing, you know, your lending on evidence. And this took over a decade of a cultural shift to, to go from a compliance issue to something that adds value to the products and services that we offer as multilateral development banks. And this is a constant process that is, um, you know, um, under place. So that's one thing. You know, we are now convinced uh, at the bank that uh, we need to have a, a mechanism that we ensures that we're, you know, tallying our resources where most that were there most needed, and with the highest bang for the buck, with the highest, um, you know, um, uh, potential for results. So we also have our marshmallow, as, uh, as someone referred to, to, to that, uh, uh, similar to our corporate score, scorecard, which we call our, our CRF, our Corporate Results Framework, mm -hmm. which is our tool that enables us not only to report, not only to be accountable, but also to learn from it. And it's also a process. You know? So I, when I see your recommendation that you need to work more on learning and, and having this uh, you know, virtuous circle, of learning from your mistakes, well, it's something that we should always endeavor, you know, constantly. And it doesn't really surprise me to see that as uh, as part of, uh, you know, of, of, of the results of your of your review. Um, second, we're uh, beyond the importance. I think for us, uh, we are having, you know, a mechanism that uh, uh, gives value to the synergies between the bank, uh, the IDB. And our uh, private sector you know, arm recently renamed IDB Invest, formerly the Inter-American Investment Corporation. So being able to report together, you know, um, uh, in, uh, in our documents, uh, you know, our self-reporting is the DEO, the Development Effectiveness Overview. We're leaving uh, copies there for you to, to, to flip it. Uh, it's the first time that uh, both the IDB, the, for, the IIC, uh, and the MIF uh, report together, you know, our results. And I think uh, not losing track of the synergies as a group is an important thing. Uh, third, uh, I, I think that the issue of, of learning, because we are, you know, we're, sometimes there's this trade-off, which was put between learning, lending and learning. But we also have this trade-off between, um, you know, responsive or being demand-driven and, and, and in a certain way being supply-driven in our evaluations and, and the work we do. And, and reaching the right balance between this, you know, lending, you know, and being um, uh, monitored of how much we lend and hopefully of quality and, and with results on the one hand uh, and, uh, 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 and, you know, uh, this, this, this issue of, uh, of, of making sure that we constantly strive to improve, you know, our, 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 our you know, the lessons we can draw from, from our operations is important. Our engagement with the board is also important. Now, I'll go that later on, and I'm glad that, that there is a board member present here. Uh, but I think that's critical, you know, to be able to internalize, 
you know, how much our shareholders value because there is a differentiated, uh, you know, value for, for this whole work from the donor or non-borrowing perspective and from the borrowing perspective. You know, countries have different incentive structures. So I think our job is to really make sure that there's no, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, the, there's no, no contradictory, you know, incentive that both all our shareholders, be them donor countries, industrialized countries, non-borrowing countries, and recipient countries, you know, uh, uh, give the same value to this this effort of uh, of striving for development results, uh, impact, uh, and the learning processes that that come there thereafter. So uh, I think um, I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I think this is a very timely discussion, uh, and and we're ready to uh, share our experience at the IDB uh, group, and uh, w with you and with other you know colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, so let's go to Shio. Thank you, August. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank IEG for uh, this event and then also inviting me. Um, the results or the managing for results is something that I'm uh, really per personally committed and feeling passionate about. Uh, throughout my career, be it being a TTL or the, in the country offices in OPCS, so I'm really glad to be here and then that so many people are interested in this subject. Um, the, well, the, oh, from OPCS, there are the, we, we really feel this uh, manageable result is very important and I, my, aside from my current added job as uh, acting director, my real job is to lead uh, results and accountability from OPCS. So we, we have a, a series of uh, um, the initiatives, changes, reforms that we have been uh, working on, we have worked on and also uh, planning to do uh, both from all fronts. The, the earlier that you saw this two uh, diagram, there are two aspects. One is the measuring and monitoring results and the more systems and tools. But then on the other side, there's a, uh, how to reuse that information and manage for results and learn. So we, we have a, a series of uh, um, initiatives, activities that in all front. The, on, the, on the right side, the, the, as you know, that we have a hierarchy of uh, different tools uh, on the Apex as a corporate results reporting like scorecard, IDA, results measurement system, but the country level there's a country uh, CPA framework and the project level there is a project. And we've been uh, strengthening it, uh, reforming it. There are several activities uh, completed like ICR reform, uh, corporate results indicators that we also uh, completed recently uh, the new um, learning uh, module for the results framework or CPF now in, into the uh, CPF Academy. And also on the learning and knowledge uh, front, uh, we uh, lead, co-lead with IFC, uh, closely working with the MIGA and IEG on the uh, uh, World Bank Group by Network of Results Measurement and Evidence Stream. Uh, that we have a, a series of a learning and knowledge sharing event, and we do an annual RAMS get together. And this year, uh, we are planning to even make a one open day uh, 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 focusing on results in May. Hopefully, that uh, you're all uh, you see the and then the invite and then uh, come to that event. Um, but then I, I can talk more detail about it later, but the, in doing so, the, all this managing for results, uh, efforts are there, but the biggest challenge is, is it on? Is, biggest challenge is uh, behaviors and incentives. So, so it's only technical solutions, it's, it is necessary, but it doesn't work unless the behaviors and incentives are aligned to focus on managing for results. So how can we um, the improve and strengthen, say, for instance, management signals to focus on results, the so-called carrots and stick um, that, uh, that work to, to manage for results. But there are a lot of constraints also. There are time constraints, resource constraints, maybe like a, the, the each uh, task team deals with I being, having been a TTL, the, the, there's, too many things which are now increased even further uh, these days uh, to focus on in preparing a project or supervising project. So the, my personal, uh, uh, earlier the Karen, uh, Karen said that, uh, that she appreciates this uh, IEG's uh, annual reminder on results, but uh, the, my personal goal has been the, to put the results as, at the center of the attention. So the, you, you all know that in the MC building, there's a, 
uh, our World Bank mission, group mission, the world free of poverty. And my personal goal is uh, manage for results without reminders. So that's the. So in order to do that, uh, we really need to uh, work on the behaviors and the incentives, and we can talk about more uh, in the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shio. This is a great reminder of the importance of result uh, to all of us. So we'll move to the next um, phase of the panel, which will be a question to each panel member. Uh, and I will um, kindly advise other panel members to take their cue from Karen, who really <laughs> stayed within the time, the three minutes. So Karen will ask you the first question. Mm -hmm. um, suppose you at the board you're given total responsibility by the governors to restructure the bank and remove all the institutional barriers that prevent us from prevent us from for managing for results. Mm -hmm. What will you change? What are the institutional barriers that you will address first? Um, so I think you know my colleague at OCPS outlined uh, very well um, what the major obstacles are in terms of behavior and incentives. So what I would do first is focus more on the quality at entry. In fact, uh, really along the lines of what Hans Peter is working on at the IFC, I would really like to see that done at the bank. And um, so there is at the outset, you have IEG validate or some other independent body validate at the outset the quality of entry. Um, because we know, again, from IEG's work over the years, the um, the correlation between strong M and E frameworks and outcomes is is so so tight, and yet we see over and over that the ratings of M and E frameworks are low. Um, it's it's rare that a majority will receive a satisfactory rating, so I think that's crucial. Um, but the second thing I wanted to talk about is um, is is the risk. Uh, follow up with what Fareed said and, and the culture of risk and failure. And, you know, this is, um, even if I were in charge, uh, which, I, which I would love to be, by the way, but um, even if I were, I, I, I'm not, that's a tough one. You know, how do you, how do you bring that about, uh, the, the risk tolerance and the culture that allows for failure? So, but I, I just want to dwell on that for a minute. Um, so I would say, first of all, the board has quite a bit of tolerance for risk and quite a bit of tolerance for failure. And people are always surprised by this. But I will give you an example from this morning. We had a, a really fascinating and productive board meeting. Rarely do I use those words for board meetings. <laughs> Chaired by Jim Kim on gender-based violence. Now, many of you know there was a project in Uganda on roads that went drastically wrong um, and, uh, and led to sexual abuse of minorities and of, of girls. And um, it took a long time for the information to surface and a longer time for the bank to respond. And their response was to really take this head on and Jim showed incredible leadership, set up a, a gender task force, and then came to us today to say, here's what we found and here's what we want to do. And the response was, this is great. This is the way that you should handle failure. Um, and that if you, if you are open uh, to learning lessons um, and, and, uh, and trying to adapt, um, then we're, we're open as well. And I still see with the performance and learning reviews, for example, um, a lot of the, the passive voice, um, the ambitions were high, you know, frameworks were, were insufficiently strong, but who's responsible? There's, there's still not enough of that. Um, I, I think that those are a missed opportunity to say, this is what we did right. And this is what we did wrong. And here's what we can do better. And then one more, one more quick, quick point, um, which is, um, really to Fareed's point about the field. And I think we more and more appreciate that need for flexibility in the field. And in fact, recently the board has approved a significant increase in the delegation of authority. Um, and in fact, we'd probably go a lot further if it were for the US because we have a very, very strong and active CSO community that's, that gets very worried about uh, delegating authority. But in, in fact, I think this will be, um, I'm hoping that this will really help uh, the, the people on the ground who are dealing with these, these 
events as they change all the time, we'll feel more empowered because I think we, we appreciate that being overly rigid is not good for results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. This is, this is great. In fact, there are a lot of questions that have come through, Paul, <laughs> everywhere on quality at entry. What is IEG doing about it? Why, is Quag, why was Quag abolished? What, yeah. Who is now responsible for quality at entry? Who is supporting the team? Uh, IEG's recommendation come too late. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's so great that we have... clear your calendars, everybody. We've just yeah. added three <laughs> so, hours. So, so with, with that, this is a good segue to, uh, to, to the question um, that we had uh, for Hans Peter on AIM. Um, so AIM is, a, is an innovation. Um, it really tries to improve how IFC, you know, looks at results from, from the beginning of a project cycle. Uh, do you see that as something that could be generalized to the rest of the bank? And what are you doing about training staff to really implement AIM? Because mm -hmm. one of IEG's findings is that, you know, there are a lot of initiatives um, that the bank group, uh, you know, come up, comes up with, but staff capacity doesn't really uh, follow and sometimes staff understanding of the initiative is actually quite low. So first, can AIM be generalized? And second, are you training IFC staff so that they can really implement it? Okay, you didn't warn me about these questions, August. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm kind of seeing that there's, there's uh, some dam broke. Uh, we, we're getting, you know, all these questions now. <laughs> I just hope we can, we can follow. Um, is AIM generalizable? I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sort of put myself in a position there to, to, to understand uh, very well how the bank approaches these issues. I'm too new for that. Um, I think the principle with, uh, with, uh, with our system that we are still putting in place, right, this still needs to be thoroughly road tested, is that we, uh, we apply a consistent framework up front and ex post. Um, I don't know uh, how it works uh, at the bank, uh, but that is a fairly simple uh, principle. Now, of course, up front, you have a lot of uncertainty. The, you don't have the information. You can't go into the field and, 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 and measure what might happen, you know, years down the road. Uh, so you have to make assumptions. You're not going to have uh, uh, sort of just uh, a, a, a simple uh, tool that helps you make these decisions. Um, and that uh, uncertainty is something you need to, to deal with. You also need to deal with the fact, uh, in my view, and we recognize that explicitly with AIM, that development impact is, has, has lots of dimensions and that it is qualitative at least as much as it is quantitative. And if, if we try to, to measure something, we're going to end up with those things that are, that are measurable and that may not be the most important thing. And you, you, you end up focusing on the wrong uh, uh, issues. Um, so uh, you, you want, in my view, a system that, uh, that is explicit about the fact that you have uncertainty and that you have a whole range of dimensions uh, and that what you ought to do is provide as much evidence as you can across these dimensions to, to support your judgment but in the end, you have to make a judgment. So what we have is, is, what, uh, is, is, is a framework that is fairly um, uh, open in terms of the uh, information that goes into it, uh, but puts a structure on the way you argue your case, uh, and then is fairly simple in the way it makes a judgment on a project. Um, and, uh, and then uh, establish indicators that is very important uh, that your judgment is going to be uh, uh, is going to be measured against down the road. Uh, if you don't say what you're going to, uh, uh, how you're going to be successful, there's nothing to monitor later on. So you have to have that, um, and then you stick to that same system. Yeah? There has been a, a structured argument uh, for uh, the case for your your uh, development impact. Uh, you have provided a series of indicators that you, you will be uh, judged against. Well, and then you, you, you keep that and you, you find a way to, to update this uh, frequently. <laughs> that is the, the, the simple um, uh, approach and that I suspect should be applicable uh, in, in a variety of different situations. Okay, great. 
Thank you very much. All right. I'm, I'm aware that, that we may run out of time, so what I will suggest is that I give a chance to uh, to you guys to ask questions. I have a long list of questions here, mm -hmm. uh, but but let me turn uh, to the audience to see if there are questions from the floor, um, and uh, we will also summarize some of the questions from Paul Polev. Right, let's start with uh, the floor. Any question? Any anybody uh, wanting to challenge <coughs> the panel? Uh, so whilst you think about your question, let me then uh, turn to Ferid with what was going to be my next question. Ferid, there, we, we've been talking about the, the, the client. You started actually as a, uh, with the two realities, the reality in the field, and you have a lot of experience in that. So could you share with us what you think um, um, the bank, what, what the opportunities are for the bank to strengthen client capacity? Uh, first, to report on result, and second, to foster adaptive m uh, management and learning on the client side. Um. Yes, thanks again. Uh, <clears throat> well, obviously, the question that will take a long time to uh, to, de to develop the answer to. Uh, let me make, let's say, two points. Uh, but let me f first start with something that Karen mentioned, the issue of quality at entry. Uh, it, it is very important because that's really where the first interaction with the client st starts, basically. Uh, one of my former bosses, uh, not to name him, Jim Adams, <laughs> <laughs> used to say, you go to a country with, with, with strong capacity and, you know, you do a, a project that is really not very well prepared, they, they will fix it as they implement it. You, you spend months putting together the best project possible. If you don't have the capacity on the other side, they will, I mean, they, we will mess it up. Mm -hmm. So th there is a discussion to be had there in terms of when we engage with our, you know, what we call our clients, uh, our partners at the end of the day in development, when we engage with them, we need not only to engage in terms of the, the project itself or the policies that we are putting on the table, but in terms of their capacity to absorb those and to translate our dialogue into a, you know, something that would allow them to put together some kind of a platform that, that brings uh, our, our discussion with them to a point where what we put on the table for them, uh, or what we agree on, you know, is translated into um, positive outcomes. Um, for instance, what I would, I would suggest uh, uh, a discussion you know, that Jim has been having over the last few months on the human capital project. Uh, the way I read it, it's re this is really uh, managing for results. You know, the whole discussion is, you know, look, look at the World Development Report. There is a, there is a whole uh, discussion on you know, how much spending uh, against education is going in the Middle East. Tons of money. The outcome, very, very, very low. So the issue here is to try to identify why, and in order to identify why, we need to bring about a totally new way, or to, way to measure you know, those, 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 those outcomes and, and make a direct link between the outcomes and the outputs in a, in, in a more efficient way than what we are doing right now. So you know, without getting longer into, into, this, into, this, uh, into this answer, I believe that our uh, you know, uh, uh, duty when we are in the field is really to work very much upstream with our counterparts. And whenever we go with the project, again, whether it is in terms of policies, whether it is an investment project, we need to start by building that capacity to implement. And that would be the best in, you know, investment we could have because that would serve as we move forward. Thank you very much, Farid. Um, so capacity to implement should be the first uh, action. Uh, uh, if we had time, I would have asked you whether we are the bank, in the bank group, we have, we are trained to really build that capacity. Uh, but this is, because we know how, somebody asked a question, we know how to, set, to sell concept. We know how to prepare nice project, nice concept note. We don't know how to really pre uh, prepare for a result. Um, so this is something also to ponder uh, as we think about staff skills, staff, ca staff capacity, whether staff has the capacity to build the capacity of the client and whether the staff has the capacity to go beyond nice document and really 
you know, a nice concept note and, and pursue real results on the ground. Um, any question from the floor? If not, I'm happy to go to... Yeah, there is a question here from a gentleman. There is a mic, a roving mic. Yes, I'm, I'm with uh, IFC. I just have a question regarding uh, how you associate the client to this process. And um, I do remember that uh, 10 years ago, the bank, especially special OPCS, was involved in um, uh, building a platform uh, called uh, uh, Community of Practice for, develop um, for uh, uh, development, uh, managing for development reserve in disseminating the reserve agenda in many countries, uh, whether in, in Africa and other uh, countries around the world. But uh, a couple of years later, uh, that initiative has vanished. We, don't no, we no longer uh, heard about you know, that, uh, that program. And I would like to know how do, you, how do you associate the client, especially in the learning process, in building capacity, to uh, country capacity to be involved into this agenda. How do you, what is the process now that you know you have, uh, you, that we are launching this uh, 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 program? How do you make the client involved into this uh, process? The second, the second question is um, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 project, uh, the, 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 the project cycle. So the bank, uh, the, the reality is that we spend a lot of time in preparing and designing project in terms of the timing, the cost, and a, a few, a few uh, time in terms of the uh, supervision and the implementation of uh, during the project uh, 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 phase, and uh, uh, we realize that TTL are most most of the time more involved into delivering the project instead of instead of being um, uh, concerned about the achieving the impact on the ground. So in this case, how do you link performance and accountability? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, Shio, um, you've been put on the spot. The gentleman mentioned OPCS initiatives and, you know, involving client in, um, in the learning process and building accountability in the process. Do you want to, uh, to start uh, taking that question? Yeah. Okay. So, thanks for the question. Um, the, the, we, we can discuss more detail, but in a very briefly, um, on the first one, the, the, the approach we are taking right now is to um, not like that directly from OPCS to reaching the clients, but then uh, like the, we are working through the different uh, channels. Because first of all, the, the focusing the, uh, the strengthening the client's capacity in the results are most, mostly or mainly done through the country team, task teams, through the project m and as well as the country level monitoring. And then we have a more corporate level um, effort to, for instance, strengthen the client's own capacity in uh, data, like statistics, house or survey, and also how the performance budgeting in some, some countries, how they, they also, um, the, the capacity to monitor the SDG. So, so it's done through the, the in individual country team, and we, we, we try to support as needed from the OPCS. The, the, having said that, there's a lot of uh, um, the, Additional efforts need to be done to, to further strengthen how we can um, strengthen the client's capacity in M and D, not the proje project M and D per se, but then it's more like how how clients can monitor their own results and then use it as a managing tool in their own budgeting, performance budgeting, and and how um, to make a decision from the results. The, on the second point uh, is uh, on the more uh, focus on the 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 preparation. Vis-à-vis uh, -vis the supervision, yeah, I, I fully agree with you that that has been a, a lot of constraints. Efforts have been done, and then I think at the corporate as well as the, the operational level to f focus more on uh, you know, the supervision and implementation. But this this also um, has a still a lo lo long way to go. But but then again, aligning incentives on uh, from the staff side and management side to focus on the the how we are. The reporting, the performance of the implementation, not just procurement is done, uh, consultants hired, but also how, how the results are being achieved, at least going toward the results. You know, how, you know when you um, review the ISRs or the you know, midterm reviews, another another good uh, opportunity to really take a quick look, uh, not quick, sorry, the the solid look of the um, the 
how we are achieving the the, the results, but but then it's a, there's a, a number of channels that we can still strengthen. But then uh, the if you like to discuss, we are be happy to discuss. You know, off of the offline. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, Shio. Um, Miguel, um, you heard a lot about our uh, dirty linen that we have exposed to you uh, here in the bank. So I'm sure you've been thinking, you know, why can they do better? Uh, so based on your experience in, uh, uh, in the Inter-American Development Bank and also in your role as a Minister of Finance uh, in, in Peru, uh, what, and based on what you've heard today uh, that we're doing or not doing in the World Bank Group, what can we learn from you, from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank and or from you as former Minister of Finance to improve uh, the World Bank Group's uh, performance on managing for results? Um, with humility, I've only been, as you, uh, in the position since the beginning of the year, so I, I cannot say what we can learn from, from you, but I can tell you more or less our, our experience and the highlights of setting up this system. I think uh, when we set up this system, when we set up the, our own corporate uh, scorecard, which we call the CRF, uh, uh, there was a, a very explicit effort in terms of uh, ownership by the whole bank. So we produce a very, very, you know, a document uh, like this that was distributed, all, you know, all over the bank and was actually built under a very consultative, you know, very participatory um, um, mechanism in which specialists, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought their inputs towards, uh, uh, you know, the best indicators uh, to monitor, you know, our progress towards our institutional goals. So. Um, Ownership was a very important issue. The other one is simplicity, because um, um, if you go into this very convoluted sets of metrics and submetrics, et cetera, it becomes a very difficult to understand and therefore to report mm -hmm. progress. Um, I think what we've been implementing this is we've been tying this to our, not only to our, and we were talking about incentives. Uh, uh, so we have our self-reporting mechanism you know, our, our, which are, it's called our, the Development Effectiveness Overview, mm -hmm. which monitors our progress towards meeting, you know, our institutional strategy, which is also one of the, um, you know, um, uh, inputs is feedback from our stakeholders, from our shareholders, from our owners, from civil society through an external feedback system. So this is uh, reported yearly and, and it's reported to the board. And this actually produces a set of uh, corporate, corporate priorities, which is the input into our budgeting um, you know, uh, process and into our business planning process. Mm -hmm. The business planning at the unit level and even at the individual level. Mm -hmm. So each uh, um, you know, um, staff member uh, in a certain way is giving incentives to align his own or, or her own work mm -hmm. towards achieving you know, you know the, these um, these um, uh, metrics. So this hasn't been done, you know, following a template. This has been, in a certain way, learning, you know, from best experiences and from our own, you know, efforts towards uh, having a system, um, uh, a marshmallow system, as you mentioned uh, before. Now, another thing I would like to, to stress, and I think this is important, and and uh, is the dialogue that we have through with this, with our governing structures, with our board, mm -hmm. because sometimes it, it, it is difficult to interpret some, some of the results, particularly when you're off track. Mm -hmm. So how come when, you know, we have a, 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 a green, red, and, and yellow light system? So when you're off track, uh, uh, how do you explain this? You know, is it a sign that you're failing towards meeting something, or is it that, that there was a problem in, in a particular project so uh, th this issue of, of engagement w w with the board is, is very important. Now, as I mentioned initially, I think uh, um, uh, this, uh, and from experience of being in government, I think uh, the, the thinking is evolving, but this is seen more primarily as a mandate from, uh, uh, you know, from non-borrowing countries mm -hmm. for institutions such as this mm -hmm. to have this monitoring progress towards meeting their strategy um, but we actually have internalized this as something that is of benefit and that adds value to our clients. So this process, you know, of continuous learning, of continuous improvement, 
and reporting our own, our own failures at the areas that we can actually are off track. And this being reported all the way in the, in the board discussions, and we're going now through budget discussions and tying our budget allocation towards our strategy, strategy and towards you know the mechanisms that monitor our, 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 our progress towards meeting or not meeting uh, is important. And also when we are financing impact evaluation studies, mm -hmm. which is a discussion from our, you know, our independent office of it uh, in, uh, at, the, at the IDB, one of the key, um, uh, one of the key uh, takeaways or conclusions was make more strategic your, you know, your selection of what uh, impact evaluations you do. Um, and this actually helps engage, you know, at a different level, you know, the relationship you have between the management and, and the board. So I think this is a, you know, it, it is, it was seen before as, a, as, a, as an issue of compliance. I see this as, as the heart of what we should deliver to our clients. Um, uh, again, this is a process of constant learning, of constant improvement. And, and I think, uh, you know, being here and hearing your, Linen is similar to our own, you know, issues, but I think if we jointly think about these issues and how to best report them, being cost-effective reporting and being as transparent as you can, I think uh, is, is the best way to go. Thank you very much, Miguel. Any question from the floor? Oh, yes, now, uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, go ahead, please. I have a question about the uh, Washington Consensus. Is the learning ad and adapting a new Washington Consensus, as was recently uh, discovered by uh, Alice Evans, who went through all the world development reports, and this is what she came up with. So I'm just curious about your feedback. In the practice. Um, my question would be um, that I think that uh, talking about management for development results has to be a question also about who makes it happen, right? Um, who are the people who are, what are the elements, you know, contributing to the management for development results? So Farid has, has already talked about the role of the client and our role in building capacity of the client to, to make it happen. But what I would like to focus on from my own uh, professional experience and uh, background is a bit uh, the part of quality assurance within the bank. Um, we are a whole community of practice uh, within the bank of people who are spread across a multitude of different units um, in charge of helping, uh, working with teams, with practice managers and others to make sure that there is quality of entry um, according to uh, the elements that you have just mentioned. That um, we are providing um, adequate uh, quality of implementation support, which means exactly what has also been discussed, to monitor performance of a project uh, while it's uh, ongoing, to, uh, to uh, discuss uh, and identify together with the client appropriate uh, action uh, in a timely manner so that these problems can be solved. And we are achieving our results at the end of the day. This includes M&E, but it is not uh, basically uh, exclusively about M&E. Um, and uh, it, it includes also portfolio monitoring, having the respective systems in place, um, and, and, and all that. So um, I feel, uh, however, uh, and, and then we have also been talking about learning from failure, and I think uh, this is also something that plays into this um, role. I feel, however, that our system within the bank is deficient. It is very fragmented. It is uh, not consistent. Um, it is underfunded. There is no clear ownership. There's clearly a role for OPCS here. There is maybe, I think, a strong role for senior management on the highest level to have more attention on operational quality and how it is organized in the bank. At the moment, it is totally uh, chaotic. Everybody does what they want. So um, I wanted to bring this to your attention. Uh, everybody who is here on that panel, some of you have a role uh, to play or a very uh, strong influence on this. And um, I would uh, very much wish that there would be a, um, um, a high attention to, to this issue uh, for us moving forward uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You, you sound like uh, the author of the IAG report, but uh, <laughs> great, thank you. <laughs> so what I suggest we do, I'm told that we have, we have to close in five minutes. So what I suggest we do Oh, Karen wanted to stay longer. No. Okay. <laughs> I love so, the <laughs> Yeah, I know. Okay. What I suggest we do is that we go for closing um, remarks.
if you allow your your remark was very good i wouldn't take it as a question i think it's more of a suggestion what i suggest within your closing remark if you can also address the washington consensus question of which i have no answer uh, so we'll start with in the reverse order with shio one two minutes of closing remark and if you can address the washington consensus question great if you cannot it's fine but what what are your your final thoughts as you, you leave this room <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, well, since I have two, only two minutes, just a, a, a couple of um, a few thoughts reacting to the last speaker. The, the, the I think the as I said earlier, the the I I have been working and trying to um, put you know results mean that means like quality to to uh, produce results, focus on results, not not just you know disbursement done, program done, but are we getting the results, development results uh, uh, on the ground. The, the, I don't, I, I don't, personally, I don't have a, a doubt that of the commitment as well as the interest of individual World Bank staff and managers that they, they really want development results impact and the, and the client and so forth. So it's not like they don't have incentives. They are self-motivated in, in, the, in that one. The challenge is that how can we systematically ensure quality and how, how can we have, how do we know that it's all done systematically? So the, you said it's like everybody does their own and it's chaotic. I wouldn't go that far, but the, the challenge he, uh, we have right now is like it's so decentralized. And uh, so where there are very kind of a commitment good, uh, managers, TTL, there are a lot of good things happening, but there are some varied um, quality capacity across the board, if you look at across the board, and how do we make it really systematic, and also for us um, at the central level and the board to know that actually we are doing systematically and then ensuring quality and focusing on results. So that's what we're trying to work on, and then uh, I'll be happy to you know get your ideas on how, how better we can do and uh, to focus more on the results. Thanks. Thank you, Shio Miguel. Yeah, I don't think it's very chaotic in the case of the IDB group, although it may be. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a, a process of of of, of, um, of constant learning. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, I think this is a very good time to be discussing this because you know there's no you know thinking about capital increases, balance sheet optimization. You know, you must make sure that every single dollar from a taxpayer, be it from Lima or be it from Washington, actually gives you know the most result. And and this is, I think, uh, in, in in this day and age, the most important thing. So I wouldn't put it as an ideological Washington consensus or or, 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 or nothing. It's just a smart use of your resources, uh, you know, delivering the the, the highest uh, um, um, impact. Um, and these have to be, you know tools that are used, you know, uh, as uh, to manage, you know, how you behave in an institution. So you have to go through reporting to actually a management type of, of, of mechanism that enables you to make uh, you know, the right decisions uh, um, or, 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 you know, and you correct in, in the way. So um, I, I think this is, a, uh, this is a, a great point for us to really think how we can do better our, our job, how we can, how we can um, you know, um, uh, uh, coordinate better among multilateral development banks. Uh, respecting that we have different shareholders, respecting that we have different, you know, mandates as well, but there is definitely an issue of also uh, uh, coordination of principles among our, ourselves of how to be more effective uh, with, uh, you know, the, the, the money that, uh, and the capital that our shareholders place in our institutions. So um, um, I would stop there. This is a process of constant learning, of constant improvement, improving, and that's something that, you know, this panel is a, is a testament, you know, of actually, you know, being very open and very uh, transparent, discussing your own issues. Um, and I think that's a lot, a lot of progress in the past few years. Thank you, Thank you very much, Miguel. Farid, you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Uh, to, to react to your, uh, to your challenging uh, remark and comment and question, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, we have a number of policies and those policies should be adapted to the realities of each one of the countries we are engaging with. 
So when you have a, you know, without getting into, into the specifics of them, <clears throat> I would see it as a tension that needs to be managed. You know, the tension is between, you know, what we have in our OPs, BPs, et cetera, et cetera, and what we feel is the reality on the ground and how, and how we can accommodate both. And I believe this is something that, you know, a, 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 an operations person should be able to do and should have the, uh, the flexibility to engage in. Although, otherwise, one size fits all and it's not gonna work. Now, I'll, I'll finish with this. You know, we, we are engaged also in a, in, a, in a very interesting discussion with IFC and MIGA on, on, on maximizing uh, financing for development, the whole cascade discussion. So the, the challenge for IEG actually is to engage in that conversation and to try to see how you can, you know, put together this World Bank group uh, proposition and initiative and provide, you know, whatever guidance you can so that, you know, we, we, we actually look at this whole quality at entry uh, when we engage in, in, in something that is being, you know, we've been doing it here or there, it was kind of a number of operations in search for, of a concept. Now we have the concept. Uh, how can we translate that concept into a set of policies that UIG could contribute to, uh, to enshrining in, 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 in our you know, daily uh, <coughs> commitment to our clients? Thanks. This is noted. Um. Coming with my IMF past, <laughs> going to come back to this, and being fairly recent here in this institution, I, I do uh, see the benefits of, of a bit more centralization. It sounds terrible. But this is a very decentralized institution. Decentralization has, has its benefits. Uh, it brings sort of the, 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 the actors closer to the problem. Uh, but it can also result in fragmentation. And uh, it can result in, in, uh, in sort of too much bottom up too little strategic. And I think on those fronts, we, we, we perhaps uh, the balance isn't quite quite right. So I, I take your sentiment and I, I see that myself. Uh, and uh, I feel we need to, to do something about that. Um, one area where I uh, can see this is in, um, uh, so IFC has, has uh, two main instruments, as investment and advisory. Uh, and I feel that uh, we don't connect those well enough. There has been progress, I understand, over the last few years. That there was a point in time when these were completely separate. So now they've been brought closer together. Uh, but uh, I, I can see loads of instances where I sort of feel we could get much more impact out of the advisory if there was also a, a financial dimension. We could get more impact out of the financial if uh, we, we improved the quality through advisory. And this happens all the time. And advisory uh, is uh, something which, uh, which needs to be put much more uh, in the sort of the first plane uh, at, the, at the IFC. I don't know if the bank has a similar problem, but um, it is part of our value proposition in the same way that investment is part of our value proposition. Um, and it's a very powerful tool uh, in, in all of what we speak about uh, here, because what's our client? Our client is is of a private sector uh, sponsor and investor. In many countries, they don't have much, much capacity. One of the biggest things we can do, uh, rather than just looking for sort of the minimum we need to get our money back, is, uh, is that we work with these clients to improve their capacity, to, to uh, help them set up uh, accounting systems, to, to, uh, to work project preparation, uh, and, and give them that capacity to work with bank intermediaries to how to select, you know, uh, clients um, that don't have collateral, uh, etc. So uh, the, the combination is very powerful. But in order to, to, to make that combination work, we have to be a bit more strategic uh, as an institution. In order to be a bit more strategic, there has to be uh, less fragmentation and, and a certain degree of, of, um, uh, of uh, working, of, of centralization, let's call it. Current. Oh, final reason. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a, a couple of final points. So I, I'm not sure um, what 
the Washington consensus is, but my, the the term makes me very uncomfortable because the original Washington consensus left no room for the client. And uh, as Fareed and others have stressed, this is absolutely has to be uh, client driven um, and we need the capacity for the client to also manage, manage for results. Um, I want to emphasize that IEG has been critical to advancing this agenda here, absolutely essential. I don't think, with, without IEG, I don't think we would be moving in the direction that we are. So I want to thank Caroline and, and her team. And um, uh, and then on on this sort of question of, of culture and incentives, um, I wanted to mention with, with Luis, I was actually at the Treasury Department working on the general capital increase that he mentioned. And it was us who pushed so hard for the managing results, and we were extremely unpopular for doing so. So I'm so happy to hear 10 years out that, you know, th there's the greater cultural acceptance of that. And I think that's that's the point, is it takes time. It takes, um, it takes leadership, but it does take time. Um, but I do think that we are... Um, we're moving, the bank is moving, moving in the right direction. Um, and then finally, it takes resources. And on the point about, you know, thinking about new capital, um, we have a lot of new resources already in IDA focused on fragile states. And I, I think there, there are some of us who are a little worried about um, how that's going to work. Because as we know, just providing new resources someplace does not mean your outcomes are going to be better unless these other issues are addressed. So we will have to watch very, very closely during this uh, upcoming implementation period of the new replenishment to make sure that everything we've talked about today is internalized as we try to generate results in some of the very, very hardest places in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, and um, thank you very much to the panel. Join me in thanking our panel. They've been really fantastic. <laughs>